Hey there everybody and welcome back to another Blender tutorial, this time with face cam because I haven't done that in a while and I have this theory that when you see my face, uh, not only do you get more like stimulated but uh, you find the tutorial easier because I can like motion for things. So if I'm saying we're making a spiral uh, like we are in this tutorial, I can go like this and you'll be like, oh, now I get it. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm doing another NFT style render today but we're not doing the NFT style branding because last time I did that, uh, you guys almost slaughtered me and I'm not in the mood to get slaughtered today. So uh, either way, it's a Geometry Nodes project. Uh, you can see I've recreated it here. Fun fact, I actually was over at my mom's house making this on my laptop. So this isn't technically the exact same blunt file, uh, but when you render this, it's gonna look the same. So we're gonna talk about how to do this kind of spiral. You can see it almost is projected on a sphere style thing with the, the colors and the, uh, the glass and the glowing and all this. And it's a super simple effect. Um, that takes a bit of brain power to make, which is kind of my favorite. I like something that can be made in like 15 minutes, but um, is a bit complicated. So that's what we're going for. So a uh, brand new Blender project. Uh, by the way, I'm using 3.1 alpha, but I know 3.0 came out recently. This It's compatible with that. So feel free to use 3.0. I don't care. I'll close my eyes. I'm not going to arrest you. So here's how we make it. Uh, geometry nodes. We're just going to take our cube and replace it with a geo nodes group without the group input. So again, uh, we have this cube with a geo nodes modifier, and we're just going to be doing a whole bunch of math that creates this thing. Now, um, if you think back to the effect, it's basically the spiral that's going up and down, and there's a bunch of stuff to it, but it's being projected on a sphere. So let's start off with that. Uh, starting off with the curve spiral, uh, there's literally a, a curve primitive for that. So I'm just going to use this curve spiral. Uh, we have control over how big it is at the beginning, the end, how many rotations, etc. Now, the question is, how are we going to um, make this start and end radius so that it's kind of like, you know, going around a sphere? And the answer is not using only this node because that would be impossible, I believe. So I'm just going to set the start and end radius to one or maybe we could send them both to two, it doesn't really matter. Either way, I want it to be uniform radius, so if I look at it top down, it'll look like a circle, and we can change the number of rotations and all this. Uh, to project it onto a sphere, we're literally gonna project it onto a sphere. So we're gonna use this UV sphere, uh, just so you can visualize it. Uh, the spiral is basically the same radius as like the largest part of the sphere. And uh, to get this to be a nice projection, I'm actually gonna, I didn't do this in the original, I guess I should have. I'm going to use a subdivision surface that's just going to smooth out our sphere. Now, the question is, how are we going to project this onto this, especially over here? Well, this is what the raycast node is for. Not many people use this. This is the kind of node that you like discover when you're 60 and you're like, wow, I, I've wasted most of my life and you can't go back. So you kind of regret it, but you're like, eh, may as well live the rest of my life knowing it now. But it's this kind of node is what we're going to be doing. So. The raycast node lets us cast rays. It lets us project one thing onto another. The target geometry, what are we projecting onto? It's going to be the subdivided sphere. I mean, you could just use the sphere, but I like this uh, subdivided sphere because it's nice and smooth. So we're projecting onto the sphere. The source position, we can just leave empty since we just want the spiral to be where it is. We don't want to alter it. And the last thing is we need to say which way to project uh, this because right now it's just projecting downwards on the z-axis and I know this is a bit hard to visualize but uh, let's say we were to project this on the x-axis and then we say okay we have our projection we want it to affect our thing then we um, set position so this is how we use it we're going to set position for our spiral in other words I'm going to like change it right and we're going to use this hit position well if I do it like this uh, you can see some weird stuff's happened um, like this spiral, you can almost see it here is projected uh, to the right as if it's being projected on the x-axis. It's not what we want. Um, in other words, we got to figure out how do we project this onto this? Well, what's the math behind that? Well, if you think about it, if I move this um, spiral up and down, like kind of like it's uh, tugging it, <laughs> um, to project one onto the other, we want to kind of pinch it inwards kind of radially inwards. In other words, from the top view, uh, we want this uh, spiral to be projected inwards is kind of the way to say that. So in other words, we just want to project it on the X, Y axis, up and down, Z doesn't matter. And that's going to end up being the negative position. I know, I know, what am I talking about? Well, if I have a point on the sphere or not the sphere, the uh, spiral, let's say here, I just want to project it this way. Well, what's that? That's the same as the position vector the place that it's at, and we flip it. So that's a negative position. Don't worry about it if you don't understand it. it. Requires a bit of vector math. In other words, take the position, 
take a bit of vector math, and we just want to manipulate the position so it gives us what we want. So um, I'm going to multiply it, zero for the z-axis, since we want to suppress it as if the height doesn't matter. And for the x and y, we're just going to use negative 1. So it's flipping inwards. In other words, radially inwards. Just take my word for it. Project it uh, as this ray direction. Use this as, as the hit position. So in other words, we're projecting inwards. It's going to hit somewhere on the sphere. And where it hits, in other words, the hit position, this is where I want to send it to. And you can see from the wireframe, uh, this gives us exactly what we want. In fact, it might be better to just uh, hide this sphere so we can see it. So when I move this uh, thing up and down, you can see it's basically uh, writing onto the sphere. Now, there is kind of like a weird caveat here, and that's this kind of like central line that makes it look like it's knitting it, which is a cool effect in its own right, uh, but we don't want it. Uh, the reason this is happening is there will always be part of the spiral that's being projected at the very top or the very bottom, the uh, nodes or poles of the sphere, um, and it's going to give us this weird result. So it's almost what we want. We just kind of want to delete the very center. And we can do that easily, right? We just take it, we delete the geometry. Which geometry? The ones that are very towards the center. In other words, we can take the position. We don't care about the Z just like last time, so I'm just going to use 1, 1. So we only care about its projection on the XY plane. Again, if you don't understand it, don't worry. We're gonna, then going to take the length. So I'm saying how close is it to the center? And we want to say if it's within some threshold, like if it's greater than, less than, I don't know, 0.5, then delete it. Uh, what this effectively does is it gives us this slider that can get us really close to the center, but when we set this to anything under zero, you see we get this line, but the moment we go above zero, it deletes it. Probably easier to see from the top view. So you can see it's kind of like a radial expansion. So I'm just going to set this to a very small positive number, and in fact, I'm going to bump the resolution just so this looks a bit smoother. Beautiful. Um, so now we have this thing that we can move up and down and it will kind of contour or outline a sphere because it would. Uh, we add more rotations to this and it will look uh, more detailed, uh, this projection. Look at that, that looks nice. Um, so now uh, that we have this curve, I guess the next order of business is to save so that we don't lose our progress. I'm gonna call this a spiral projection. And uh, the next order of business is it, it could be to give this thing thickness because if we kind of render this, you're not gonna actually see anything, right? Um, but I'm thinking the next order of business is we want this to go up and down like ping-ponging, as you saw in the render. Well, uh, you'll notice if we move this down on the z-axis, again, that, this is rubbing the uh, spiral down the sphere, and then it's getting projected. You'll see that when we kind of go a bit past negative 3, it's gone, and on the other end, if we go past positive 1, it's gone. So we want to ping-pong between negative 3 and 1. So let's do that uh, super simply with a bit of drivers and math. So I'm going to use a division to do hash frame. That's going to give us the frame number we're animating over time divided by 20. So it's slowed down. So this is going to give us a uh, time divided by 20. I want to take this. I want to have it ping pong. And whenever you think ping pong, you could literally use the ping pong command. Uh, but I always like sine and cosine because it's smooth instead of just chick, 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 like a boomerang, right? Uh, you want this nice smooth sign. So this is going to go up and down and up and down. Um, only issue is sine goes from negative 1 to 1, as you probably know. Uh, and we want to go from negative 3 to 1, is what we said. So I'm going to map negative 1 to 1 to negative 3 to 1. So over time, we have this sine function going from negative 1 to 1. We're remapping it to give us this uh, two numbers that we want. And we want to do it so that it goes up and down on the z-axis. I'm just going to connect that here. So you can see now it's going to the very top and then to the very bottom, and then to the very top, and then to the very bottom. Um, only thing I would change here is I don't want it literally to go right down to the pole. Um, if anything, I want a bit of curve left over. So instead of negative 3, let's do negative 2.5. So it doesn't go all the way. Instead of 1, we'll go to 0.5. So you'll see now it goes most of the way, but there's a bit left over. And then equivalently, there will be a bit left over over here. Okay. So all these nodes, if you didn't understand anything, long story short, we've made a node system that gives us a spiral that follows a bunch of rules. So this is still a, a curve, okay? It's still a curve object. Uh, what we want to do now is convert this into a mesh so it's something we can see and render and all that. So uh, we'll take this curve. Again, it's a heavily modified curve, and we're going to turn it into a mesh. So curve to mesh, uh, what do we want to kind of fillet it with? or what, what thickness should it have, uh, we're going to use a circle. So we're going to sweep a circle along this uh, modified spiral. And you can see uh, we've created a poop emoji. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to bring down this radius to something I like. Okay. Um, 
Only thing is, it looks boring, and you'll notice at the very top we see this exposed opening, which there is a way to fix, I imagine, I don't know. Um, but to fix both of these issues, one, to make it look interesting, and two, to fix this kind of open thing, uh, I'm just going to pinch the ends, because it makes it look interesting, and, it, you know, it's pinched. So let's do that. Uh, to pinch it, we almost want to set the radius to be very tiny at the very beginning and end of the spiral, but keep it thick in the middle. How do we do that? Because we only have one radius. It can only be uniform. Well, uh, there's a convenient node for this. It's called set radius, set curve radius. And what it lets us do is change the radius just like before, but you can see this is a field input. Uh, so we can put in different values at different points. Um, how do I know where I am on the uh, curve? Uh, well, there's a field for that. It's called curve parameter. Now recently, and I think this is a 3.1 thing, or maybe it's 3.0 updated, uh, curve parameter is now called spline parameter. So if you can't find it, use the other. But I think uh, for now it's called curve parameter. Either way, it's a uh, output that goes from zero to one, zero being the beginning of the curve, one being the end, even if we update it and it's changing over time. So if we set this to the radius, you can see it's zero and then it climbs up to one. So the bottom is always gonna be pinched and that will change where the bottom is as this thing goes up and down. And the uh, top will be a thickness of one. Cool, but we want both sides to be pinched. Well, um, in other words, we can just send this through a color ramp where it's going from zero to one. I take the two endpoints, I set them to zero, black, and in the middle, I set them to one. So you can see it's black or it's black or zero, and then it gets thicker, and then it gets thinner. And this will work uh, as it updates because this is happening after we have this updated curve. Um, in fact, you can make this nice and smooth with a bit of easing. It's up to you. And all of this is procedural. Of course, I'm going to bring down uh, the number of rotations. And I could do that on the fly. So I could have this kind of lame version. I mean, it looks cool. Or I could have a more detailed version. And I can have it be low resolution or high resolution. And I can actually change the thing it's being projected to. It doesn't have to be a sphere. But... Okay, so this is kind of like the bulk of the geometry stuff. So we could add additional effects like wireframe. We'll make it look interesting and all this. Uh, but for now, I'm happy with this. Uh, so the rest of this is just creating a nice material and hitting render. So let's do that uh, super quickly. So after all of this, we turned it into a mesh. I'm just going to apply a fancy material that we are going to assign using the set material. So you can see we're using the basic uh, default material that opens with every one project, and now we just need to edit it. So it's using material. I'm just going to rename that to glass, and you can see it updates here. Uh, so for the glass material, just to make sure it's working, let's try to change the thing. Yep, it's working. So this material data is being sent over here. Uh, let's just make a simple glass material. Uh, to do this, I'm going to use cycles because it looks better. I'm going to get rid of this light and I'm just gonna load in an HDRI. So I'm just setting up the scene so we have nice reflections, refractions, and all that since it's glass. Um, for this, I've experimented. I found that um, interiors tend to look a bit better, kind of orangey interiors. So I'm just gonna use this HDRI I found. Get one from HDRI Haven, they're free, doesn't matter. Uh, make sure you set this to transparent, and more importantly, make sure you set this to transparent glass. Uh, this is gonna be important when we turn this into glass. Uh, to do that, bring up the transmission. Boom, it's glass. Bring down the roughness and it's shiny glass. So you can see before transparent glass and after. It will make it so that this has a alpha that is low instead of just refracting what's behind it and it kind of looks metallic. So just enable that. So we have this glass thing and it already looks pretty cool. By the way, uh, you I guess you should set a uh, shade smooth, but I think it might already be technically, whatever. We have glass. And what we want to do now is color this uh, procedurally. So it goes from, uh, it goes along the colors of the rainbow, uh, but it somehow knows where we are. Either way, um, long story short, this uh, curve parameter, this thing that tells us where we are along the curve, is valuable information to send over to the material. So let's do that. Uh, how do we send an attribute? Or, a, or kind of gave it away. How do we send a field? into the shader editor, we gotta make it an attribute. So I'm gonna attribute capture, I'm gonna capture information. Which information? The factor. So what I'm doing is again, we have this uh, curve we made, we deleted that needle thing in the middle, so now we have this modified curve. Once we're there, I wanna capture the information that tells us where we are along the thing, that's the factor. You could store that on the points. And we wanna take this attribute and send it out of the modifier. So now in GeoNodes, you can see we have output attributes. I'm going to call this like spline or something. 
What this does is it lets us bring this in via an attribute node. Type in spline, make sure these two names match or otherwise it won't work. And you can see, it's kind of hard to tell, but you can see it gets, it should be black here. It's so pinched that it's hard to tell. I guess if I was to delete or hide this uh, set curve radius, you can actually see. So it's black and then it gets brighter and brighter and brighter as we go up. Um, in other words, we've sent the information and it's going to update as we're along here. It tells us where we are along this. Um, so if I was to, you know, use a color ramp, this is not the way we're going to do it. But if I was to set a uh, color ramp and uh, separate the two and visualize it so that one is red, let's say, and one is blue. So you can see how it's going from one to the other with the purple transition in between and it's updating because the length is always going to change. Um, what I actually want to do with this is to get the colors of the rainbow. I'm not going to do that with the color ramp. I'm just going to use a hue saturation, which is kind of a weird choice. Uh, what hue saturation does is it lets us pick a color like red, and then as we change the hue, it gives us gives us different colors. But if we change the hue relative to this factor, uh, now we get a bunch of colors. Now, one caveat here is um, standard color management will give us a smoother gradient, I believe. I think. I mean, it kind of looks smoother. I don't know. You could deal with that if you care. I don't. Uh, just a caveat so you know. I'm going to take this color. You can either connect it to the base color, so it's kind of like this stained glass. And this will look super fancy. And this is uh, good by its own, right? Um, I mean, honestly, this kind of looks cooler than what I did. Uh, so you could either do it like that and, you know, take your camera, zoom in, whatever. Or I kind of went for the glowing version. And just so you know how you do that, uh, instead of here, you connect it to the emission. Make sure the glass is perfectly white. You connect it to the emission, and you have it not glow everywhere, but relative to some Fresnel. And this is just going to let us kind of select these edges. So connect that to emission strength. So in other words, I'm saying glow, uh, but only at the edges. And then you take this, so you can still see the color, but this time it's emission. You take this, and then you multiply it by a big number. So it's very bright there. Um, and we want to bring this very close to 1 to keep it true to what we want. Maybe slightly under 1 would be fine too. Um, so you can see uh, we have the color but only at the edges. This just kind of looks a bit more interesting to me. And uh, at this point you just, you know, you set it up for render. You enable motion blur. At this point I'm just going to kind of speed through it. You enable motion blur, you make it a nice render, but I'm just going to render a single frame and show you a tiny bit of compositing. So here's an example of a frame that we'd output. So it's just this kind of stained glass. Uh, to get the nice, um, use alpha, uh, to get the nice uh, glowing thing, uh, basically I'm just going to set up some nodes in between here that make it glow. So I guess first thing first, I'm going to alpha over this since it's a transparent background over some color like black or gray. Just put something in the background um, and now we want to make it glow. Uh, kind of cool way to do this is using the sunbeams node, which is going to give us these rays of light as you can see. So we can set their length and all that. And then to overlay this over, because you can see it kind of get, get, nah, get, get, get. it kind of gets rid of the original image. Uh, we just want to mix these two together. So I'm mixing everything before the sunbeams and then after the sunbeams, I'm going to add these together. And you can see, and uh, now we have both. Uh, you bring this number larger than one, it's going to glow a lot. Uh, you make it under one, it's going to glow uh, less. So I'm going to actually make it glow less. I'm going to do something like that. I'm then going to maybe also add a normal glare. So this will just be a normal glow. So let's see this version. I want this to be a fog glow that's pretty intense with a low threshold. So you can see now uh, we just kind of get some highlights here. I'm gonna bring that even lower just so it glows. And uh, we wanna mix that over as well. So I'm gonna bring this to one so it only gives us the glow. Add in another addition. I know compositing is boring. I agree. Uh, we add this over, and now you can see here's without the extra glow, and here's with a bit of extra glow. That just gives it a bit of a bit of oomph. Uh, change the exposure to what you like. Change the gamma to make it a bit more intense. Make it higher contrast. And uh, there you go. That's the render. So basically, every single frame is going to get that kind of com compositing pass, but it's going to look nice because of this animation where the color is updating. So uh, I, I think that's the essence of how you make it. I think you get it uh, at this point. How long? 20 minutes. My lord. Somebody should have told me. Um, okay. 
end of the tutorial. So at this point, I just want to say thank you to all the uh, patrons. And wait, don't don't leave. This isn't uh, the credits where you skip the movie. There's a after the credit scene. Here's what's up. Uh, patrons not only support this channel and the CG Matter channel, they do, but they get a bunch of benefits that are relevant to you. So main one, first one, early access to tutorials. You could have seen this tutorial and almost every single tutorial I upload early sometime usually a day early but sometimes multiple days early especially if i'm on a trip um so you could watch tutorials early also um you get access to blend files so you can download this where it's finished probably the version i made on my laptop if i can get access to it but um you can get the original blend instead of uh just following the, the tutorial and make it yourself so you get access to every blend i've ever uploaded on patreon which at this point's a couple hundred so there's a lot of resources on there i'm um, also exclusive tutorials which i upload at least once a month sometimes i make tutorial series sometimes i make multiple tutorials so there's tutorials you haven't seen over there and in general uh, if you want to fund uh, this and the cg matter channel which is actually the main way uh, these two channels make income and I can keep making tutorials tutorials available to you for free in a nice and easy and understandable way. Uh, this is the main way to fund it. Um, yeah, so thank you all 600 to 700 to 800. I don't know how many there are of you at the moment. Uh, active patrons, you guys are the best. And um, that's it.